Hi everyone, welcome to the Public Affairs Public Broadcast, Public Access Channel. Um, tonight we're here at Houston Media Source talking about what we're calling a social justice roundup. Um, I guess in the studio tonight we'll be talking about the issues and events that have taken place that have affected us from right here in our backyard to our neighbors in Dallas to those in the east in Florida and Louisiana and all the way up to the chambers and the U.S. Supreme Court. These issues that are taking place continue to spark dialogue and to continue the debate on issues surrounding racial justice, um, LGBT equality, reproductive justice and reproductive rights, as well as the intersection of all of these issues. So I just want to let everyone know that while we do have the guests in the studio, we welcome you to call in with your questions or your comments. You can call in at 713-807-1794. And with that, let's go ahead and meet our guests. Tonight we have Brandon Mack. Hi, everyone. Brandon is a community activist here in Houston. Um, we also have Francis Valdez, who is a... Oh, <laughs> who is an immigration attorney and activist here in Houston. Uh, we're moving on to Andrea Greer, who is also an attorney and activist in Houston. And then finally, we have Mike Webb, who is a community activist here. Um, so, as I said, tonight we're talking about all these different issues that were um, coming up, and I think what we're going to do is start with some Supreme Court decisions, because as we were talking a little bit before, uh, these major decisions came out of cases right here in Texas. So with that, we'll start with um, the Fisher v. Texas case, which was a case on affirmative action, and you know, I think we're going to go ahead and let Brandon take the lead on that. All right, so just for some background for those who don't know about the Fisher versus Texas case, uh, in 2008, Abigail Fisher sued the University of Texas when she was denied admission. Uh, her claim was that she was denied admission because she felt it was against her race and that the top 10% rule that governs college admissions is ineffectively anti-white and against white students. So she sued the University of Texas and it went through the entire appeals process all the way to it got to the United States Supreme Court. In 2013, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a 7-1 decision, actually kicked the case back down to the Fifth Circuit, saying that the Fifth Circuit needed to put a stricter scrutiny on the case to see if, in fact, the policy was done in good faith. The Fifth Circuit decided that, yes, in fact, it was done in good faith and that the University of Texas's policy isn't against any particular race, but does uphold the value of assisting in creating an inequality and a race and a racial uh, diversity within an institution, and they viewed that as being a public good and a good of education. So, once again, Abigail Fisher decided to sue and continue the case back to the United States Supreme Court, and this year in the 2016 decision, um, the United States Supreme Court upheld that race can be used in admission decisions and that the and that the uh, University of Texas did use a strict scrutiny in that particular case to decide that yes to use race in in affirm in affirmative action and in college admissions is actually serving a public good and that diversity in college admissions does in fact lead to a public good and I definitely couldn't be happier with the decision because of the fact that we need diversity and we need to ensure that our classes are reflective of the world that we live in because that's how we learn from each other. We learn from each other by being in co in contact with one another. And for um, and one of the assertions that was really made was that um, an A and a B is different in every single school. Well, that's not true either. Even though our schools are very, very different, let's deal with what's going on within our schools. This definitely led to a call for us to improve the education within each of our uh, institutions. So I'm very happy with the decision. Yeah, wow, all right. Well, with that, did y'all have anything y'all want to add, talk about on that? No, just a, as a graduate of the University of Texas, um, I got my undergrad there and my law degree, and I can attest to the fact that UT is not representative of the state of Texas, and as the flagship university for the state, that is a disservice to all the taxpayers in the state, and, um, and UT has tried um, different ways to increase diversity, and I think that 
I am glad as well that it's allowed to continue to increase the diversity, but as you mentioned, it shows a larger problem of the K through 12 education system in our state, which is really where the problems start. Um, and anyway, that's another topic around school finance and issues like that. But um, but yes, I mean, it was it was a victory. And I'm just saying as a Longhorn, I'm very pleased. Go ahead, Longhorn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one other thing that I would want to add that I think that has really kind of sparked because of this particular case is the whole notion of college admissions mm -hmm. and the fact that it is not an entitlement system. It isn't a number system. That the need for holistic review is important because if this case had been struck down, people I don't think realize that that would have taken the system that we currently have where we're able to consider all different factors, not just race, but also context in terms of the fact that the SAT and the uh, ACT, the two big standardized tests that are used to govern college admissions, they are culturally biased and they're also mm -hmm. socioeconomically biased. If this decision had came out in the other way, there's no way a college or university would be able to take that factors into consideration. It would have been just purely a number system. Mm -hmm. So then think about your institution and what it would look like right now. One of the things that we pride about in Houston is being one of the most diverse cities and being home to some of the most diverse campuses in the country. Mm -hmm. University of Houston, Rice University. Imagine if those decisions came down the other way, our institutions wouldn't look like that. We would not have institutions that reflect the diversity of our city and would literally be only a place for individuals who come from means, individuals who come from specific areas, who would be getting access to an education. So I'm definitely happy of the fact that this is calling into conversation. How do we look at college admissions? How do we make our uh, institutions more equitable and more reflective of the full diversity of our country and of our uh, particular areas? Wow, good, good. All right, so now we'll move on to our next case. Um, we've had a good discussion starting off with affirmative action, and let's move on to um, some reproject reproject reproductive justice work. And so we had the case um, Whole Women's Health um, versus, I don't know, how do I put it? Oh, said, that right? Okay, mm -hmm. and so we'll have Andrea, why don't you go ahead and take us the lead on that? Perfect, I'm glad to do that. Um, I wanna back up and do a brief history um, in giant leaps and bounds, which is 1973 was the Supreme Court decision Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. And that's what legalized abortion in this country um, across the board. It was already legal in a few places, but that gave every person in every state the right to access that medical procedure. Um, not everyone supported that decision, but we sort of went along for a while until 1992, there was a famous case, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, that dealt with some restrictions the state of Pennsylvania had put on the right to access abortion. And the ruling in that case sort of set into motion the strategy that had been slowly unfolding, which was it's very difficult to overturn a Supreme Court case, but it's much easier if on a state-by-state -state basis, each state enacted little rules, little laws, I can't really call it a little mm -hmm. law, but let's, let's see how we can restrict access. Let's make it a little bit harder. Let's make it a little bit less available and see what happens. And so the Casey court happened, then we had another case, Planned Parenthood uh, with Carhartt, um, another regulation that was actually struck down, um, but the court struck it down and basically set up the language for, that's not how to do it, if you wanna do it, here's really what it should have said. Um, so you can see there's a lot of gaming the system going on. We come to Texas, we come to HB2. Um, almost every time the Texas legislature meets, they try to regulate abortion. They propose all sorts of laws. Um, very few of them have even a tangential relation to a person's health, um, but legislators aver that they do so that they can justify them. Uh, it was very unusual in 2013 because often these, these laws get proposed. Um, they go sort of a little bit through the system and then someone quietly shuts them down. Mm -hmm. The legislators get credit for proposing them um, but nothing dramatic happens. Well, 2013, something dramatic happened, and that was that people showed up. People showed up in the regular session and made a big deal, and it was not the same 10 or 15 lobbyists on either side of the issue, who are some fabulous people who we appreciate being there, but um, the community started showing up. And the community that looked, if we're talking about what does the state look like at the university level, what does the state look like at the healthcare level? Younger people showed up. 
people not from Austin showed up, which is a huge challenge when you have a law. You've got to go to Austin to talk about it. And if you live in El Paso, if you're 19 years old and living in the valley, if you're living in East Texas and there's no public transportation, how do you get there? Um, brinksmanship happened. Mm -hmm. It got pushed and pushed. And this decision uh, came to be that really dramatically restricted the ability of people in Texas to access abortion. Uh, the two things that were challenged in this case, Whole Woman's Health, the name plaintiff, is a uh, abortion clinic provider that has clinics not just in Texas but around the country. They challenged it. Hellerstedt was the head of the Texas um, State Department of Health. They changed the name of the agency. I apologize if I've gotten it wrong, um, but that's who they sued. Uh, two of the requirements that came to fruition in the case were Doctors who provide abortions were required to have, by law, admitting privileges to a hospital. Now, abortion is one of the safest outpatient medical procedures there is. There's actually no need for a doctor to have admitting privileges, admitting privileges no medical need. Um, if something goes wrong, which in a very, very rare number of cases it might, um, and someone goes to the hospital, the hospital is going to treat that person in an emergent situation. They're not going to turn someone away. Now as hospitals have um, consolidated, and many of them have become owned by religious institutions, many hospitals were unwilling to give those admitting privileges to doctors. That would have dramatically limited the number of doctors who could provide abortions in the state. Um, it, it just, uh, well, it also then became a double issue that they put in a whole host of requirements that said abortions have to be performed in a very specific kind of clinic, an ambulatory surgical center. and. The challenge there is that all of these clinics have been built. They're very expensive to build. They're very expensive to operate. They're very expensive to modify. And again, there was no medical necessity. So a whole woman said, wait, you are going to shut down clinics. You're going to dramatically limit access to this procedure. In a state as big as Texas, you can't do that. Um, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, there was a notable comment from one judge who pointed out that while it was a great distance for people to travel, the road was flat and there wasn't much traffic. Supreme Court looked at that, listened to that, considered it, and this summer they said in one of the most highly anticipated cases, people were sitting in front of their computers as all these other cases already come out and hitting refresh and waiting for the decision. Um, I would say this is the most significant abortion decision, certainly since Casey and conceivably since Roe versus Wade, because the Supreme Court, in the majority opinion, said in no uncertain terms, we are no longer going to accept at face value if the legislature says we're doing this for a legitimate medical reason. We're not going to necessarily believe that's true and defer to your legislative judgment on that. We're going to examine these restrictions and really look at, is this impeding access to this right? Uh -huh. um, you know, So that was a very, very big win. Unfortunately, many clinics had already closed. Yeah. There's a great deal of confusion on myself who've known the ins and outs of abortion law in Texas for several decades still had to look today because I was not entirely sure what was still legal, what is legal. HB2 had several other provisions that were upheld, so that are still in place. Mm. Yeah. It was a wow. <laughs> There's so much that's going on. So much that's going on here in Texas. Um, so did y'all have anything to add? Um, but you see this as a victory, but go ahead, Brandon. You. I definitely think it's an amazing victory, and I always find it interesting when it comes to reproductive rights that men feel the need that they have a say-so in this when we do not produce children, so therefore how are we governing what happens with women's right to choose? So I'm very happy in the fact that this was a win for that. But what it also to me shows as a win is when people get involved in the political process Absolutely. and the fact that so many people went to Austin and used their rights to be able to say, we have a problem with this. We want to see this be, be changed. I hope that what, it, what this win does is show that when you get involved in politics at the local level, mm -hmm. it can lead to the positive changes that you want. So that's what I would hope is another lesson that comes out of this. That is absolutely, and that's what was so remarkable to me. I'd been spending legislative sessions up in Austin observing, and like I said, it was the same 10 or 15 people. And all of a sudden, starting in the regular session, we were at hearings and there were 30 or 40 people. Mm -hmm. And then everyone uh, wore the same color shirt. And so we all recognized each other. And once you wear the same color shirt, you start to look like a bigger crowd. And a law that I really think they thought they could pass during the regular session, we managed to shut down. They called a special session, and that's when everyone really kicked into gear. We flooded the Capitol. There was one night that we refer to as the People's Filibuster. 
I was there. There was it was a committee hearing. Um, it was remarkable. It was an overflow crowd. There were people not just in the hearing room, but in three overflow rooms. There were people outside. People were sending us pizzas from Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. People who had been involved in the labor issues and the teacher strikes up in Wisconsin in solidarity with Texas were sending things. We were hearing from people in Brooklyn and people in California. Um, I think that's another great thing that's come out of this, right, is that now we have this connected network. Twitter was turning people out. And you can never tell me that social media is not important because I've seen what it could do. We pushed this to then Wendy Davis's filibuster where um, somebody, it's not clear who and it will never be investigated, actually tried to change the clock to say that the law had passed when in fact her filibuster and then people literally shouting so loudly mm -hmm. in the chamber prevented the law from passing and they had to call yet another special session. Um, unfortunately, they're at it again the governor now, without the legislature even in session, has proposed a rule, again, not medically necessary, um, with some requirements about how fetal remains are disposed of after abortion. Uh, they've had almost 2,000 comments submitted to the administrative person in charge of that because this network is now activated. So, What are, what are abortion rights organizations doing now to prepare for the onslaught that's about to happen during the session? And yeah. how can the everyday community member get involved in that? Um, it's a great question. I think connecting with people so you know who to look to, who to ask for what's going on. Um, and you know what? There is a role for men to play. There's a role for everyone to play because it's not necessarily only women who have to cope with abortion as an issue. Absolutely. So um, learning, too, to think about abortion in the context of other access to health care. I mean, I think you're sort of our expert here into mm -hmm. how different populations have a much different experience of the medical system. Mm -hmm. And for some women, access to abortion doesn't really matter they can't get access to birth control. Mm -hmm. They can't get access to preventive screening. So abortion is a whole different level for them. They couldn't afford it if they could get to it. Um, we have women today in Texas, men, all kinds of people crossing the border to procure drugs on the black market from pharmacies, from flea markets, um, because even though abortion is legal, they still can't access it. So. Um, it's really the, the framework that was created for reproductive justice that gives us a way to look intersectionally at this yeah. and to find other activists to connect with, to learn from the HIV community, to work with other networks, to think about the needs of immigrants and see where we can stand there and when we're all standing together. Uh -huh. yeah, so, Yeah, standing together. <laughs> so with that, we're going to go ahead and move forward. Now, um, we've talked about a couple of victories at the Supreme Court. Now it's time to talk about a setback um, that we've had at the Supreme Court, and that would be um, an immigration issue, uh, U.S. v. Texas. Uh -huh. And so we'll go ahead and let Francis talk about that. Thank you. Um, so I know I'm glad that you mentioned the intersectionality because I think the late June was a difficult time for many of us who yeah. have are in, interested in multiple issues. So. Um, the immigration issue definitely hit me hard and a lot of immigrant rights people. Um, so I remember being kind of in a fog with the Fisher and then the abortion decision. Um, but I'm really pleased about those. And I don't know, I, I have this, I don't know, I don't know what happened in the Supreme Court, but I feel like maybe abortion was the decision, I mean, immigration was the decision where they kind of made a deal and said, well, we'll kind of hold off on that one. Mm -hmm. um, because, and really, I mean, there is a history of this, uh, to this. Um, basically, you know, we, especially in a place like Texas, um, there are a lot of people who are living here without status. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, uh, there was a reason because the borders have become um, more militarized, um, while at the same time, we have, people have been pushed out from their countries for multiple reasons, wars, some that the U.S. have started. Um, trade deals that have made it difficult for people in their countries and just you know the human um, right and need to feel like they need to be in a place where their families can be um, healthy and prosper and you know our country did not used to be so restrictive with immigration um, but especially since the uh, mid 90s um, we've become we've actually criminalized immigrants a lot more um, if you look at the raise uh, just the criminalization of individuals 
um, and the rise of the prison population. You also see the rise of um, immigration detention, and you can look at how um, the same people who are building um, prisons are building immigration detention facilities, um, and so there's also money behind this. So there's a lot of factors behind this, right, or for why we have around 11 million undocumented people in this country. Um, and and the immigrants rights community has been fighting. It wasn't since the late 80s that we had an amnesty that, that did allow a number of people to become residents. So it's been uh, a long time since we've needed a victory and something to help a lot of people here. Um, a lot of people, um, there is a movement that I've been really involved with, um, with young um, undocumented individuals called Dreamers. Oh. And um, Dreamers are really pushing for um, the DREAM Act. So a lot of people have heard of the DREAM Act. and. That failed in 2010. Um, and so then there was a shift to, for immigration reform, and th that has been failing. Um, and eventually, uh, Dreamers led a movement for something called Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, DACA. And in June of 2012, because of immigrants, immigrant activists, um, Obama um, was forced, basically, to make a decision and to help um, the young undocumented community. Uh -huh. um, and he announced DACA in June 2012. Um, and that was a great victory. And it helped, we think about 1.2 million people are eligible, about 750,000 people have, um, up, have applied and been approved for that program. Um, but then, you know, I think with that community was thinking, well, this is fine for me, but what about my parents? What about my family? What about the rest of my community and the 11 million um, individuals who had the same dreams that I do? And actually, um, dreamers often call their parents the original dreamers, the ones who came, you know, with the dream for their children and wanting to, um, to do better for them. And so there was this push that we need to do more. Went back to the drawing board, Conference of Immigration Reform, and Obama had been promising that in his first um, um, term. Um, it didn't work, right? It wasn't working. And um, so again, activists decided, let's push for something else. Um, and so, so it's always been a privilege to work with the Dreamers because um, they're always on the front end of things, not afraid. And then usually they do something that people um, think is dangerous or not maybe the right idea or the right time, and then everyone winds up jumping on board later. <laughs> so that's what happened with the DAPA program, which was um, the Deferred Action for Parents. Um, when it was announced, it, it was actually interesting because although a lot of the activists who fought for it actually wouldn't have, their parents wouldn't have qualified because the program required that you had a U.S. citizen or a lawful permit resident child. So if all of your family was undocumented, you wouldn't qualify. Um, but a number of the community, their parents did qualify. And we think, um, I think the number has been thrown around between 3.5 to 5 million people would have been eligible for DAPA. And so November 2014, um, Obama makes another announcement on immigration and announces the DAPA program for people who have been here since 2010 um, with the, the child that's a resident or a citizen, um, no serious crimes, of course, and um, a few other requirements. And everyone was really excited and ready to go. Well, back to Texas. Um, I think we need to not forget about um, Governor Abbott's role in a lot of that's happened lately. Um, and so Governor Abbott decided to sue the government. Um, and they chose a very conservative judge in South Texas, which, you know, Brownsville, which is very interesting because, you know, we all know Brownsville has a large Latino population. Um, but this judge is extremely conservative. Um, and they found the judge that would rule in their favor. And I say that because um, what the president has done, he can do. He has the authority. Um, DACA, DAPA is not a change in the law. Um, uh -huh. It's an executive action. Um, and as you know, president, he can decide where the resources that our government has can be used. And so I like to explain to people, it's like when you watch um, the criminal law TV shows uh -huh. and you see lawyers making deals with each other. The reality is, is that we don't have the resources to prosecute every case. So prosecutors have to decide which cases am I going to go forward on and which cases am I going to settle. Well, same thing with the government. So Obama has said, because we are not going to deport 11 million people, I'm going to make a decision on who we will focus our resources on. And I want to um, make sure that this population is protected. 
and um, there was a lot of controversy controversy about him talking about wanting to focus on um, criminals and like I said immigrants have become more and more criminalized so that was definitely problematic um, but a lot of deserving people um, would have been able to get a work permit it would not have been deported um, and so basically what um, Judge Hainan and Brownsville did was stop the DAPA program in February of 2015. And so the immigrants' rights community has basically been on hold since then, letting, having the, um, the, the, um, the case go through the courts. Fifth Circuit, very conservative, of course, ruled in Texas's favor. Then it gets to the Supreme Court. Well, Scalia dies, <laughs> and we know that the Congress will not allow for the appointment of the Ninth Justice. So this is an example of how, in honestly, if Scalia had been around, probably wouldn't have been in our favor, right? <laughs> but um, if we had had a, another justice right, appointed, mm -hmm. who knows, right? And so I think it's a travesty, you know, that our Congress has not done its job and appointed a ninth justice. And this case is an example of how that has hurt real people, mm -hmm. right, in our country. Um, and so basically, unlike your decisions, is there one line decision that basically said, we are divided and the Fifth Circuit stands. Mm -hmm. And so we went back to, there's still an injunction. Um, and it's kind of confusing because this was a case based on the injunction that stopped the program or stalled it. So we still have the case in chief going on in Brownsville, but we know how that's gonna go, yeah. right? And so it was a very painful time for a lot of us in the immigrants' rights community. But on the bright side, which I'm trying to look on the bright side, is that we were on hold for a long time. And so what I'm excited about is um, I think a lot of us are regrouping um, and getting our energy back. And this gives us a chance to think creatively again mm -hmm. and to think about what's actually better. Because DAPA wasn't going to protect the 11 million. It wasn't going to help a lot of the parents of dreamers, and we need better. We need better for the 11 million um, people who are helping to sustain our economy and working alongside of us and our friends and family. And so I'm hopeful that we will come out of the summer stronger um, and doing something really innovative. Um, and I really always say look to the youth because they are the ones that tend to come up with the really bold and wonderful ideas. Mm -hmm. And so. I hope that maybe, um, you know, really soon I'll be back here talking about our victories. Um, yeah. But yes. for sure, the next president is going to have a lot of say in this matter. And so um, up now until November is a really important time to continue mobilizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Mike asked what people could do if they wanted to get involved. I think an important lesson, and you're so right, if you look at the Dreamers, what they did and their willingness to come forward and saying, I'm here. Mm -hmm. and I'm not documented, but I still deserve to have a say in my future, mm -hmm. has been so powerful. It's been powerful in the reproductive justice movement to have people say, I'm here, I had an abortion. Because the fact is, the people who have abortions now are people who have children later, mm -hmm. they might have had children before. And the people who are undocumented are working right alongside people who are perfectly documented, mm -hmm. are working alongside the rest of us. Mm -hmm. They're paying taxes, we're paying taxes. We're all together in this, and we were all the same kind of people. Mm -hmm. There's not a certain kind of person who does one thing, mm -hmm. and a certain. And so, the example of them of the dreamers just uh, step forward, mm -hmm. say what you're doing and what you believe in, and people will follow you. Definitely. And to tie into you know college admissions mm -hmm. and higher education, because. DACA students step, step forward, institutions are now having to think about how they can mm -hmm. help those students in terms of being financed in college education. So by them stepping up, they're paving the way mm -hmm. for them to get access to education and for institutions to better serve those, uh, those students. So it is very important for people to speak up. But mm -hmm. also in that particular case, I think of all the different people who are elected in that, in that situation mm -hmm. and how voting is so important. Mm -hmm. Because if you had 
<clears throat> the right judge who is supportive of your community, that decision would have been different. If you had the right prosecutors and district attorneys who are supportive of that community, then that action would not have happened. If you had the right president in office mm -hmm. and the right composition of lawmakers, it also goes in the right direction. So once again, it shows how important voting is at all levels and how all elections are very, very important. It's not just the president, it is literally that local person mm -hmm. who could literally have that huge impact on what happens in your day-to-day -day life. I also think it shows, um, and I think in immigrant rights, it was a really unfort unfortunate lesson. And I think that a lot of times when we have like left issues, um, people have abandoned Texas, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. we're a hard place yeah. to be. And th those of us that are progressive, we live it every day. We know what that's like, right? But we're here because we love Texas and we know its potential. And I think that the country has now realized you can't forget about places like Texas. You can't just say, oh, those people in Texas, let's just leave them alone, because Texas can actually change the country. Absolutely. And so because of our governor in Texas, people all over the yeah. country can now not apply for DAPA. Mm -hmm. And I think that as we're organizing, um, you know, like you said, organizing is local, it's also state and national. Yes. And we have to think about how our communities affect each other. And Texas is a big place and we have the ability to, uh, there's a ripple effect when we, when something happens here for yeah. sure. Yeah, the summer just showed yeah. these three cases that had positive as well as negative effects mm -hmm. on what could happen across the entire country, so. Yeah. And all came out of Texas. Yeah. All came out of Texas. <laughs> You're right, Texas is coming for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, um, you know, unfortunately, we don't even have the time to really talk about all the tragedies that have happened all across the globe. I mean, today we're focusing on um, things that are happening within uh, within these borders. Uh -huh. And I we can't move forward talking about what happened this summer without talking about what happened in Orlando, Florida. Um, I remember it was the day of, I'm with the, 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 the Houston GLBT political caucus, right? And uh -huh. we were having this big anniversary party. And I remember getting a call from Mike saying, we have to talk about this. And I was like, talk about what? And then he said, CNN's been talking about this all night. And then he was talking about the people that died. And so um, it, anyone can talk about, like Mike, Brandon, mm -hmm. you know, we can talk about what happened. Like, what were some of your immediate feelings knowing that there were 49 people that had been murdered in that nightclub, right, by this gunman? So. I I personally have grown very frustrated with the mass shootings that have been happening. And I remember talking to one of my closest friends, and I was, I was like, we can start preventing these, right? Like, these are preventable acts at this point. We should have had enough of these tragedies to allow basic background checks not to happen. I mean, like, it's, 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 it's become very frustrating. And so that was my immediate reaction. It was like, why is this continuously happening? And why are people not having like that wake up call, that light bulb moment and say, okay, some laws need to change. We need to hold ourselves more accountable with the weapons that we carry. You should not be able to kill 10 people in a second. Uh, that's, that should just logistically and systematically become illegal and harder to do. Uh, that was my first reaction. My second reaction was how can someone evade our home uh -huh. like this? Because for the LGBT community, our, our club is our safe space. Uh -huh. uh, specifically because we're, we're oftentimes, and this is definitely the case in my own personal story, uh, pushed away from our own homes, like our physical homes. And we're, we're, we're pushed away from our families. And so we create our families. Uh -huh. And we usually create our families in these spaces um, that for a lot of people are just a social outing, but for us, it's like, it's our outlet to be gay. In fact, my first gay experience was in a club. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so I was thinking of someone coming into my home and shooting at me. Uh -huh. uh, I was also sad by a lot of the responses I saw from our leaders, specifically in Texas. Uh -huh. uh, we saw, and whether it was an accident or not, one of our own elected officials oh, God. pretty much saying that this is what God intended for us. Mm -hmm. We saw a lot of our even pop stars say something similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it really just communicated the position that the LGBT community is still in, even with the victories of marriage equality mm -hmm. and the inclusion that we say, at least on paper, that we have for our community. It still showed to an extent that we're second-class citizens um, 
not only in, in the United States, but definitely here in Texas. Uh, but I also was affirmed in a sense because there was a great deal of support that mm -hmm. rose up uh -huh. um, from all types of communities. And I think for the first time, even some black folks, quite frankly, had to come to terms uh -huh. with whether that was my child in that club mm -hmm. that I know that he goes to. Um, in fact, I got a text from my brother and my mother, um, who I have a difficult relationship with, uh, saying, be careful. And that was the first time that she even acknowledged uh, anything about me being gay. Uh, so I, 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 I think it was a wake-up call in a sense of this is a community that we need to start paying attention to. It also helped us identify those who would never be on our side and we need to quite frankly get out of office and stop mm -hmm. holding them in these leadership positions. Uh -huh. um, but so that, that was my primary reaction. And I think it really glued the gay community together. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. It united us. I remember even for the event that the caucus was holding, there's so many people coming. It was supposed to be a fun uh -huh. membership drive. Yeah. Essentially. <laughs> yeah. And just seeing all of Houston essentially all of Houston, we were getting so many calls mm -hmm. from the Houston Chronicle to just everyday community members saying, what can we do to support the community? Yeah. And that's still happening to this day. Even, even Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee said that she wanted to have like one-on-one -on -one conversations with transgender uh, individuals. And that was groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. Like this historically black leader in our community saying like, this is a priority item for me now. Uh -huh. uh, and that happened, I, I believe, based off of this horrific thing that happened in Orlando. Okay. I will say for me that when it was initially happening, mm -hmm. I remember going to sleep and seeing on CNN the coverage starting saying that there was a shooting at Pulse. And I have been to Pulse uh, in Orlando wow. before, so immediately I draw that connection. And when I went to sleep, it was just a few victims. Yeah. Waking up and realizing that this was now the largest mass shooting in United States history, and it took place in an LGBT club on Latin night, mm. and that most of the victims were Latinx and African American people. I felt so personally just defeated that someone who looks just like me and comes from the same intersections that I did literally lost their lives just for having fun and being who they are. And to me, it woke up so many issues that we have to deal with in this country. First off, we have to deal with the fact that our lives are not treated equally. The media doesn't even portray our lives as being equal, so we definitely have to put fault with that and we need to repair that. The fact that people like Dan Patrick, let's call out who mm -hmm. did what, felt the need to be disrespectful about the loss of life shows once again that we have to have lawmakers who really value our lives and be in those positions of power. Um, the fact that a lot of Islamophobia played such a huge part in the identity of this individual and in the way that it was being talked about. We have to deal with that. We have to deal with the fact that we deal with people like that without having all the facts. Yeah. And then that trickles down into how we interact in policy. Um, gun reform, I mean, we can go on and on, but it needs to happen. And to me, the thing is that all these intersections and all these issues need to be dealt with and they need to be treated equally. And that's the way we're going to, we need to approach this. Yeah. And that's the only way change is going to come out of this tragedy. And I am very happy that one of the things that came out of that was the formation here in Houston of the LGBT advisory board with 49 people to commemorate that. Because hopefully through the actions of that group, we're going to let the lives of those 49 people matter and that actual policy can come out of it. But I want to challenge us all to really think of the fact that this, I do not believe it was coincidence that this was the largest tra uh, nope. tra tragedy that happened in a mass shooting. Um, that it happened with the LGBT community because right. the, the language that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, the stigma that we use mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis promotes this behavior and promotes this ideology and this mentality. Uh, and it comes from our churches, it comes from our government, it comes from our mm -hmm. friends and our family. And, and I really hope that if a positive thing can come from this, it would be that recognition that we need to change how we even think about the LGBT community and how we communicate about the LGBT community and most importantly, how language matters. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and recognizing cultures and intersections matter. I think the fact that it was a Latino night um, at the club really brought home like the, the need for us to come together racially, mm -hmm. um, even within the LGBT community. 
So it looks like we have a caller. Um, caller, what's your question or your comment? Hello. Hello. This is Christina. Hi. Hi. <laughs> hey, Christina. Um, thanks, <laughs> hey, thanks so much for taking my question. I'm calling because I saw in um, the Chronicle a couple articles about Devin Anderson, the district attorney, mm -hmm. and some um, like rape victims that for some reason were locked in the jail. And I'm trying to follow all of that and kind of figure out what's going on there and why the Harris County District Attorney would be holding someone who is a rape victim who's there to testify against her attacker. Do you all know anything about that? Oh, yes. Have you all heard of any? Anybody want to speak to that? I mean, I'm tagged by Devin. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. It is unconscionable. And I think what, what struck me, um, the first story came out, for those of you who don't know, that there was a woman who had been sexually assaulted. She was going to testify in a case she actually was testifying against her attacker. Um, and she broke down on the stand. She had a complete and total mental health breakdown. This is not unusual for a survivor of rape to have this happen. And uh, for a number of complicated reasons, mm -hmm. lack of access to care, um, and just sort of an inability to deal with any any crisis like this with anything other than a punitive criminal system, the attorney's response was, I need this person to testify again, and if that person doesn't, I better put her in jail uh -huh. so I can make sure, so I can compel her to appear. And as the story was coming out and we were finding out about this, I mean, this was brutal torture for a woman who'd already been horribly violated. Then she goes to prison where she's misidentified in jail as a rape perpetrator. Uh -huh. She's not isolated from the general population. She is attacked. She's re-traumatized over and over. Whether she can ever recover for this is anyone's guess. And then several weeks later, it bubbles up that actually, this is not the only rape survivor who has been jailed in order to compel testimony. Uh -huh. um, this is not appropriate. This is not the, just as immigrants don't belong in jail for walking across an invisible line on the ground. Women don't belong in jail for being victims. We are not, we don't, we can't require them to enforce justice by putting them in jail like that. Our district attorney has to go. And I know that this is not the only issue with this district attorney. I'm sure that someone here can speak about the gang injunction. Exactly. We can talk about police violence and police shootings. This city needs to get it together. This is a city that can get it together. Mm -hmm. We know how to do this. Mm -hmm. We know how to respond. So we need to get the people who are the problems out of the way. Yep, and definitely the first thing that goes with that is being is voting because mm -hmm. hashtag by Devin is a real thing. We have mm -hmm. got to get out there and get her out of that position of power because there's so many violations of constitutional rights that are going on within that one case, not to mention 287G, the gang, Southland Gang Injunction, all these different instances that show that she is not about the entire community of Houston, Texas. And the gut reaction is to jail people. I think that's just, like, there's no solution being built. I, first of all, it shows a tremendous disconnect from the actual community that you're attempting to serve or you claim to serve by um, putting a survivor of rape in, in jail. First of all, she was re-traumatized on the stand. Um, and then you just exceptionally triggered during jail. Like, that just shows that you absolutely have no idea what it means to be a survivor or rape first off just just first so you just you just connect it from the community so you should already go and I think people um, need to remember that all these elected officials including Devin and Anderson uh, are, work for us they serve us we're their boss and she's putting us in jail even though we're the ones that were criminalized again exactly and, and that's, that would not be acceptable in a corporate environment. That wouldn't be acceptable in a, definitely in a nonprofit environment if I was to uh, <laughs> put someone who just found out they were HIV positive in jail to protect them to make sure they go to a doctor's appointment. Uh, that was her reaction, essentially. Uh, by Devin. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so, Bye, Devin. Uh, yeah, I agree. And I think that it's a larger issue with our criminal justice system in this county. Um, like you said, all elections matter, and we don't always remember, um, you know, our sheriff is also up for mm -hmm. election, and I think that he also defended um, this situation. Um, there have been multiple deaths that have occurred in the jail that he has 
said were not his responsibility. And someone mentioned 287G. I just wanted to quickly explain what that is. Um, for immigrants, um, basically, um, if you are arrested in this county and, or the city, because the city sends the mo most people to the county jail than any other um, area, um, you could, you're fingerprinted, and then from there, if you're undocumented, those um, fingerprints are shared with um, ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. They're basically like the police for immigration. Uh -huh. And essentially, you don't even have to be convicted. Okay, so a lot of times people say, well, everyone who's caught up in 287G is a criminal. Well, I also like to remind people that there's this idea of innocent until proven guilty. And I think that it's, it's a real big problem in this country right now, not only with what's happening with 287G, what's happening with a, a lot of the black men being killed on the street for just being black. Um, I think there's criminalization of black and brown bodies um, that is just is happening, and it's happening in Harris County. And I think that, you know, um, a lot of times we talk about things that are happening around in different places and it's upsetting, but I think it's also, it's even harder sometimes to realize that it's here. Uh -huh. um, but what's, what's encouraging is like you said, is we can do something about it. Uh -huh. um, and so, and also um, if someone, I don't have to hog the mic, but wants to talk about the South, South Long Gang Injunction, um, I think that that's also really, um, important issue, uh, the county attorney defended Devin Anderson and essentially saying that around 92 in black individuals were criminals mm -hmm. um, because of perceived gang affiliation and were essentially exiled from their community without any notice, without any charges, without, without knowing at all. Um, and, and, and so it's not just Devin, our county attorney defended this, um, and still this day defends it. Um, although the there was, you know, they decided not to go through with it because of the community involvement, and that's another example of how the community speaking out and talking about something that was basically done in secret um, has made changes. But the fact that it was ever done, it it makes me question. For example, someone who's a county attorney, especially as lawyers, when these people. Their job is to defend the Constitution and the law. Uh -huh. And when you are um, implementing clear, clearly unconstitutional um, action that affects vulnerable communities, I think all of us that are belong to vulnerable communities should be offended by this uh -huh. and should be extremely concerned and, um, and, need, and need to, whether or not it's being taken out of office or being spoken to, um, that, that we are, aren't okay with it. And I think that as we sit around this table, um, I would love for us as we move forward um, to, to show our elected officials that we're united. Absolutely. Right? That, because I've been in many meetings, as I'm sure many of you have, where um, they look at me as a brown woman and they want to say, well, we're really upset about the black community. And I have to say, well, that, that's offensive to me because I'm concerned about that community as well. We're one community and you can't divide us, right? And I think that the more that we talk about all of these issues together, um, the more people are gonna realize that we're, we're a strong force that they have to listen to. Yeah. I find it, oh, single issue people. I just, mm -hmm. How, how can we better, because quite frankly, the people in power are white people, <laughs> primarily white men. Uh, how can, and I've seen fairly recently, even the South Lawn Gang Injunction as an example, right? And so uh, advocates of color were trying to educate a certain civil rights organization um, on the South Lane Gang Injunction and to hold an elected official accountable for their decision in that process. Um, during that discussion, uh, all the white people in the room were defending that elected official based off of one issue area, which was marriage equality. And all the people of color in the room uh, were against supporting this elected official. How can we better build that bridge? And how, and how come that's not apparent? Like for me, it was so obvious that all the people of color were speaking against this. And why, as a white person, could they not see that immediate division that happened within that scenario? 
and not recognize how wrong that is and the, and the privileges that are associated with that. We're in such a difficult position here in so many ways that we have so few elected officials, right, who are even close to good on some of our issues mm -hmm. that I think we sometimes get in this hostage mentality of, well, they're good enough right. on enough things uh -huh. that we better not risk everything else. And we've got to risk it because it's not right. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. Because if we all, exactly as you say, if we get played off against each other, then we're not focusing on the larger issue. If we're not finding the one thing we can have in common, which is our own humanity, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and saying, it hurts me when it hurts you, mm -hmm. and that's wrong. And just because you did one good thing doesn't mean you get a pass. Uh -huh. um, you know, what are we doing to raise up the voices that just have not been in power and say, this voice matters to me, and I'm gonna step back and move it forward instead. That's a big part of it. I think it's important for people to address those issues head on, to call things out in a sense, because that's the way that people are able to address it. When we gloss over it, we allow and we support the furthering of it being swept under the rug and it not being addressed. So for example, the criminalization of black and brown bodies is happening here in the city of Houston. I mean, we've had two cases, Alva Brazil and Ashton Barnes, within the last couple of weeks that have happened. We have the South Lawn Gang Injunction, we have 287G. All these things are related, they're not single issues. So I think to me that's one of the ways we address it, is when we see that they are not just one issue that affects one community, but we see that that affects all of us, because it could be all of us. Because when you are not at the table, you're on the menu. Mm -hmm. And I'm t unfortunately, people are ready to eat, and they're ready to eat all of us who are a part of these marginalized communities. So when we get together, and when we fight on equal issues together, they have to pay attention. And when they see that coalition coming, they're going to respond. So I definitely encourage people to not be silent, but to address these issues head on. Right, and I think that if we look at the systems that are oppressing us all, and I think it's very clear in Harris County that it's the criminal justice system is one of the main systems that is oppressing all communities. It affects the LGBT community, black, brown, women, and, and we, we, and it needs to change. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we can also look at, you know, and sometimes it is a common en enemy, and I agree with what you're saying, um, we need, one thing that working um, with immigrant youth has given me is not to be afraid. Because uh -huh. like you said, when you see someone who is undocumented and willing to s scream it out from the rooftops, I, it made me realize I can't, what am, I can't be afraid of anything. Uh -huh. and, if, and if you don't, if we don't ask for what we deserve, then we're gonna get what we have, right? right? And I mean, the reality is, is that just like um, there were um, actually some improvements made um, for the trans community in the jails under Sheriff Garcia. Sheriff Hickman has done away with all of those. Um, and what, okay, if an elected official cares about marriage equality, but what happens if um, one of our trans brothers or sisters is, is put into jail, Exactly. right? Um, and how are people responding to that? Um, and so, um, yeah, I agree. We have to speak out, and I think those of us that have multiple identities have to um, have to try to explain that. I don't know how people can understand it because it is tricky, and I think for those of us that have multiple identities, it's difficult. But I think recognizing our humanity. I like what you said. Um, we're all people, um, and I think for as a progressive movement, maybe that's something that we need to focus on more: is the common denominator, uh -huh. right? And you know, we have um, in common as progressives, we believe that government is actually a tool that we should be using mm -hmm. to improve the lives of everyone, to create equity, not just equality, but equity. So we can do that. Um, when I talk with my friends who are really confused about how to get involved, they're, they're not black or they're not trans and they, they understand it and they wanna be supportive, but they're afraid they're gonna say the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. I would say, you don't all have to be experts. Like all of us are clearly experts on everything and can <laughs> speak so eloquently, but actually none of us can speak eloquently about everything. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is meet people, learn who to trust, learn about the organizations, like the caucus that you can go to. You don't have to know where every politician stands on every issue. You can find groups that align with your values and you can follow them. Mm -hmm. And it's okay, you don't have to take the lead and you shouldn't take the lead on everything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to just go say, 
Mike, I'm here, I'm standing behind you. Exactly. Here's some water. And say, hey, Fran, I need you beside me for this because your presence there is gonna say so much and you don't even have to say anything, but just being there matters. And how can I show up when there are children who are standing up and saying, I'm not documented, how can I sit at home exactly. when they're risking that? Yeah. And I don't have to go out and be an expert and I don't have to speak Spanish uh -huh. and I don't have to do something for them or be in the street every day but I can look and say, hey, Francis, what, what can I do to help you? How can I support you? Uh -huh. And that's part of how we do it. Definitely. Yeah, elevating voices is so, so important. Well, oh my gosh, as usual, <laughs> <laughs> I always think, we're gonna have to do another show. <laughs> we're gonna have to do like a summer roundup too. I didn't even get to everything on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, one of the themes that I'm seeing out of all of this it's regardless of, one, we're multi-issue. We are, none of us can be a part of just one issue, right? We're all, all a part of this together. You said in the beginning that this together is togetherness. Whether we're talking about these Supreme Court decisions, uh -huh. whether we're talking about what's happening in politics, what needs to be going on, like who do we need to get out of the office? Uh -huh. And it's harnessing that, the power of the collective. I think that is so key. Harnessing the power of the collective, making sure that we can get folks that are reflective of a full and community in leadership. And then when those folks get in leadership, that the, that the folks are supported. And realizing that unless we, that we're better together than separate. Yes. I think, and oh, go ahead. I think that's happening in Houston though, right? Go ahead, talk about it. That's what makes me happy. Talk about it. Talk about it. Because like, I, like, for instance, I challenged New Leaders Council on something that was very racially based and make sure I have enough time. Mm -hmm. and, I'll let you know. But like New Leaders Council was so receptive to it. I was surprised because normally I was like, you know, you get that black, you racist against white people uh, feedback and that was not the feedback I got. It was like, how can we get, be better? And I'm also seeing us being more cross-sectional, intentionally intersectional. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing us leading movements. I mean, the, the caucus is now led by primarily black people, <laughs> which is like the first time in its entire history. And, and that's going, not just the caucus, but so many other organizations. And so it's happening. And, and I think that's what gives me hope. And you can get involved too, right? <laughs> uh, you can get involved with New Leaders Council, the Houston GOPT political caucus, Texas Organizing Project. There's so many opportunities for all of us to get involved in Houston. Uh -huh. and, and so we had all these terrible tragedies. Uh -huh. yeah. But I think just the people at this table show that we can do something about it. Uh -huh. Definitely. Well, once again, I'd like to give Houston Media Source just great my gratefulness because they allow us to be able to come on here and have these discussions. We've had so many discussions that what could be called like charged topics, but we, we have this venue that we're able to do that. So I am grateful for that. And um, one of the themes that you heard throughout all of this is how important it is to vote. Oh. Voting is so important and that all elections are local, right? Local elections are so important because the people that we elect live with us. They go through all of this. They understand what's happening here. So it's so important to vote. And I will tell you, voting starts, early voting here starts October the 24th. The first week of early voting is from 8 to 4. The second week of early voting is from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Okay. Um, Election day, it'll be the second Tuesday. It'll be November the 8th. That is an important day. Make sure you cast your vote because your vote is your voice. And so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. Thank you for the questions. Um, just thank the panelists. Thank you all so much. These are dear friends. I've been working out in the field and the work and, and the work continues. And so I'm always thankful when, when folks are able to come on and, and quite frankly, have a frank discussion. And so remember, your vote counts. Vote Vote early, October 24th. If you have to vote on election day, because I do know some people like to vote with their neighborhood, they all like to go, make sure you go to your precinct on November 8th and vote all the way down the ballot. <laughs> so with that. Vote the card. And vote the card. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, thank you all um, and have a, have a good night. Thank you.